Shall we start with some introductions and then hopefully a few more will have joined in a couple of minutes. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, yes, so we'll start with some introductions and then hopefully some more people will join us. Um, so my name is Anne Howard Lewis and I work at LEAP, which is Lambeth Early Action Partnership um, in the public health team. So we're really excited for this webinar today. It's the third in a series that we've been hosting over the summer. Um, and today we'll be focusing on eczema and skin trouble in young children. Um, so the presenters and the panelists, I'm just gonna run through a few, a few housekeeping issues um, before I hand over. Um, so the presenters and the panelists will be the only people with audio or video interaction throughout the session. Um, so we won't be able to kind of see anyone's faces um, who's attending, unfortunately. Um, we're also recording the session so that we can share it with you afterwards and, and with colleagues that aren't able to make it. So I hope that's okay with everyone on the call. Um, so throughout the session, we're hoping that the chat function is working and it looks like it is. So if you wanted to make any comments or any questions in there, we'll try and get to them as much as we can. And then there's also the Q&A function where you can put specific questions. And at the end of the session, we'll have like a dedicated bit of time where we can go through and ask the panelists those questions. So you can use either of those functions. Um, and any of the questions that we're not able to get to that we always try and respond to in, um, in an email afterwards. And we'll make sure that we share all of the materials and resources and your CBT certificate as well. Um, and at the end, we'll be asking you to complete a short feedback survey, which is super helpful for us. Um, so when we close this session, it should kind of appear on the screen, but I'll send a link afterwards. So I think that's everything. So I'm gonna hand over now to our fabulous presenters if you could introduce yourselves um, and then we'll start the session. Um, Lindsay, do you want to go first? Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me. I'm Lindsay Adana, I'm a children's community nurse um, and I'm the team leader for the Patch Children's Community Nursing Team at Evelina London. And I'll hand over to Tom. Thank you very much, Lindsay. So I'm Tom Mars. I'm one of the allergists at uh, Evelina London um, Pediatrics as well. And I look after all of the young children who are referred to the allergy service at St Thomas's. Um, and then we have Danielle as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Isis. I'm a pediatric dietitian um, from Guys and St Thomas's. And I work alongside with medicine optimization team across South East London. So part of my role is support patients uh, with cow's milk allergy and ensure appropriate prescription for hypoallergenic formula. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us all. It's fantastic to see you all here and I hope that you enjoy it from now and do put in any chats or any queries on the boxes that you have. If there's the little thumbnail, you can move that around the screen. So if you can't see a slide, uh, just move the talking box around and you'll be able to view whatever you need to. So yeah, we're privileged to have the panel with us today. I think it's going to be really uh, essential because eczema is so, so difficult amongst young children. So we have around a quarter of all babies developing eczema in the first few months of life. And you are the guys who can pick these things up and it would be really helpful to signpost, look, these are the signs that we see as part of eczema to be confident in that and then direct them to make sure that they can get some proper care from other clinicians. Early treatments and appropriate strength of treatment is really a cornerstone. So we want to concentrate on recognition, the impacts that eczema can have and how to juggle eczema concerns with dietary concerns as well. So we will talk through mostly hearing from Lindsay at the start with a couple of case points so that you are able to really focus and see what we mean when we're talking about challenging eczema in a young age group. And then specifically concentrate on some signs within that. So you're confident about spotting that with the babies that you come into contact with. And then I'll have a mention about how to manage foods when we've got worries about what may or may not be an allergy. And we'll talk with Danielle about the role of milk allergy before we finish and have a decent time for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So we really want to cover what is eczema, how to spot it, how we go about management, and then what to do if the eczema doesn't respond. We want to talk about introducing egg and peat nuts, 
not in the same children who've got uncontrollable eczema because we need to do other things if that's what's going on but in children who otherwise are doing well and they don't have um, challenging eczema then we should be confident with recommending regular and uh, so incremental gradually introducing peanuts gradually introducing egg and keeping it in their diet so they have it as part of their regular diet when to consider cow's milk might be an issue and then we'll finish with a q and a so those are the target topics so next slides and this is my pleasure to hand over to lincia thank you very much Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. So I will get right into it. So what is eczema? Well, eczema is an inflammatory skin condition. And I think that's really important because I think we have historically described eczema as being a dry skin condition, but it's an inflammatory skin condition that causes itchiness, dry skin, rashes, you know, scaly patches, blisters, and can also cause skin infections. There are about seven different types of eczema but we'll predominantly focus on atopic eczema and like Tom said it does affect about a quarter of babies that are born and about one in ten adults. Um, the most common way that I think we tend to explain what eczema is is with the brick wall analogy. Um, so healthy skin is like a brick wall, it has like plump cells um, that are full of water, they are surrounded by fats and natural oils um, the, the healthy skin is waterproof, it's protective, it keeps moisture in and external irritants, allergens and bacteria out. Some skin with eczema may not be able to produce the same amount of water, um, fats or natural oils as skin with non-eczema, no eczema. Um, so this makes it dry out, it loses its moisture, it loses its protective layer. Um, skin with eczema is also easily damaged, allows external irritants um, and allergens and bacteria to enter it and it causes it to become more um, red, inflamed, itchy and possibly infected. Um, and this inflammation we typically, typically call a flare-up. So the itch results in scratching, which then in turn damages the skin, which results in the release of chemicals that cause further itching um, and inflammation and um, that leads to more scratching and then you have the itch scratch cycle. I won't really go too much into it. Um, the exact cause of eczema um, is unknown. And we think eczema is um, caused by a combination of your genetic makeup, because it often runs in families, external irritants, um, which we call triggers, and the immune system um, overreacting. So children with eczema might also have asthma, allergies or hay fever because they are called atopic conditions. Next slide, please. Um, I want to introduce two patients to you. The first patient is um, a little boy called Kenny that I met when he was six months old. I met him in clinic. He was born at term, um, exclusively breastfed up until he was weaned. His eczema started when he was about three months old. Initially, um, started with um, eczema on his creases of his feet that spread up his body. He was very dry, very flaky. The family tried lots of different emollients, but moisturizer creams that they didn't really help. They also had a course of antibiotics that didn't help and his parents felt that that actually made his skin worse. His face was oozing um, fluid. He was scratching until it, he bled. He was really itchy. Um, the GP had prescribed 1% hydrocortisone, which wasn't really helping with his skin and wasn't clearing his skin at all. He has an older brother who's two who has mild eczema. Um, but the eczema was really impacting his whole family. Now the family was sleeping. And as you can imagine, there was high stress in the family. Um, they, the family had tried eliminating dairy and eggs for a couple of months, but didn't really feel that this made a difference. Um, next slide, please. The second patient that I want to talk to you guys about is uh, 
a five month old little boy called Joseph, really similar story. Um, Excellent developed when he was quite young, two months old, progressively getting worse, tried lots of emollients, um, fam he was breastfed and mixed fed with breast milk and naptamel. His mum felt that cow and gate milk made his skin worse. Again, they had a mild topical steroid, which didn't really help. Mum has eczema herself and so used her own moderate um, potency cream which also didn't help his skin. Um, this mum was really tearful in clinic. She was really worried that because she had minimal dairy and you know eggs and fish in her own diet and during pregnancy, she questioned whether that could be the cause and questioned from an early age whether this was an allergic um, factor. So in terms of the plan, the plan for both children were quite similar. In terms of the plan um, for Joseph, he, because we couldn't manage eczema with really potent steroids, um, I recommended they trial a dairy-free diet for six weeks with reintroduction. I got the GP to prescribe him some um, a hydrolyzed formula, and I recommended lots of emollients, and he had a potent steroid, and because um, he had a positive um he had some, when we reintroduced the dairy, he had, his eczema became, began to flare up again. We had confirmed through that, that there was possibly a dairy intolerance. And then I referred him to the allergy team. Next slide, please. In terms of spotting eczema, um, atopic eczema can be present in like large or small patches in any area of the body, usually starting on the face in babies um, and often affecting the skin creases, the neck, the back of the knees, elbows, the wrists. In um, like Asian, African and Afro-Caribbean skin types, um, which tend to be darker, um, they have different patterns of eczema from white skin types and these include eczema around the front of the knees and the back of the elbows. And that's called the reverse flexoral pattern, um, as well as it can still be in the skin crease as well. Some, some children have red bumps that are more of a papular pattern, which can appear over the chest or the back, um, or, or sometimes their legs as well. Some children have dark or light patches of eczema and um, parents are often worried about that kind of change in tones probably like a hyperpigmentation but you know the skin tone does usually return to normal but it can take quite a long time next slide please so in it can become infected with different types of infection the most common is probably staphylococcus aureus so we advise patients to see their gp depending on the severity they might need topical or oral antibiotics. The signs of infection might be weeping or oozing, crusting, and they might have a fever. Um, I usually get, so, not, so eczema can ooze, but the fluid tends to be clear. So I usually ask my, my families to just dab the, the ooze with a bit of tissue and it should be clear. If it has like a yellow or green tinge, and we know that it's infected and they definitely need to um, need a review usually by their GP. Um, eczema can also mix with other like viruses to form different infections. For example, um, eczema hepaticum. So when eczema mixes with the virus that causes cold sores, the herpes simplex virus, it causes something called eczema hepaticum. And that might be areas of like, really painful worsening eczema um, tend to be blisters that look a bit like the early stages of cold sore they tend to be circular a bit uniform um, children can become really quite unwell with eczema hepaticum so it's definitely a medical emergency as children might need antiviral treatment in terms of things like um, uh, chicken pox or molluscum, we always advise for, for children to stop the steroid creams because then that could spread 
the chicken pox or the molluscum viruses. Next slide, please. I have a quick question. Can we talk about actually what these individual pictures are showing? Because actually what you've shown us is a remarkable array of different skin types, signs and things which it might be helpful just to talk through what we're seeing to help spot the difference between infected skin and then the, the earlier so the signs two of pictures, Yeah, so the two pictures at the top, baby's cheek and the, and the foot, um, that's a typical... in typical infection that you, um, what we might generally see, more than likely this baby probably has like an overgrowth of like a staph bacteria and will probably need something like, um, on the baby with, with the cheeks might need something like fecidic acid or fecidin H, which is like a um, topical antibiotic. But the baby's leg, which is really quite severe, might need something a bit stronger. And it might be um, that we use a combination cream, maybe something like Fusabet, which is uh, fusidic acid, which is antibiotic, and a mixture of um, bethamethasone, which is a potent topical steroid. And that just will help to help that infection. Some children might need um, an oral antibiotic, and we tend to use flutoxacillin, obviously depending on, you know, um, microbiology, etc. Um, the pictures at the bottom are eczema hepaticum. I was trying to find um, a picture of, of eczema hepaticum on dark skin as well as on white skin, just to see that sometimes it can be a bit different. I think the picture with the um, little boy's face is really dramatic. Sometimes it can be just a few little um, areas, but what you're looking for is something that looks very similar to a cold sore, often in clusters, and the children can become quite unwell. It might be that the parents note that the child has a fever before they notice the actual rash. And, and but the, 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 like I said, the kids do get unwell quite quickly with, with fever and lethargy. And, you know, so definitely go advise them to go to A&E. Um, yeah, this is really important. So thank you very much for that. So yeah, I, I think the two things which are different to the pictures that we were seeing before is the nature of these being so res, so raw and having areas of open eczema. So both exactly as you said, Lindsay, the degree of pinkness and redness and open sores mm -hmm. all on the face for that top left picture suggest infection. The top right, you can see these little punched out areas like a hole punch, mm -hmm. which are characteristic yeah. of the virus. And then the cold sores with the crusting and the ooze that will always be there, that crusting ooze, which suggests that mm -hmm. something else is making an infection. Exactly. So can we compare, if we go back a slide, Angie, can we just look at some of the previous signs as well? So here, there are some areas of broken skin as well, but it's much yeah. more dry. It's much more about yeah. flakiness and roughness. So if you see on the top, uh, the top right two pictures, there are some open areas, but it's not as weeping, it's not as oozy, but you can still yeah. see the signs of eczema, which are key there. So the edges are not very clear. There is a sense of redness and on the right bottom, you can see some pinkness to the skin, even though in pigmented skin, you don't always see that redness though. So the bottom left is an example where we've got hyper pigmentation. So the skin appears to be mm -hmm. darker, and that's to do with the skin trying to heal itself and it heaps up and scars and gets thicker. And so it starts to look dark and that's not a side effects of any creams. So darkening mm -hmm. or lightening patches is down to the eczema and the skin trying to heal itself. And it's not down to any side effect. Dryness in the scale on that bottom left one where you've got the knee as well. So these areas are normally thickened and there's pigmentation change as well. If the family say it's itchy, it is some form of eczema. And that's really yeah. important with all of these long standing rashes. So I just wanted, we could go and talk about other pictures as well, but those are fantastic <laughs> pictures. So carry on, Lindsay. I just didn't want to lose that opportunity. They're fabulous Thank photos. You. Oh, next slide, please. So I wondered if you all, oh could spot the eczema, because eczema can sometimes be mistaken for other skin conditions. That's all right, you could put the names up. So the first one is acne. 
Um, so acne takes several forms, sometimes whiteheads or blackheads, pimples or nodules, or sometimes it can have cysts. I have lots of teens who um, might have eczema on the face and really they have acne. Um, the second one is eczema, which is like Tom is with hyperpigmentation, also some lichenified skin where the skin has become really, really thick. The third one is hives. Um, they are red or pink welts that can be large or small. Um, sometimes they sharpen by themselves or in a group. Like eczema, they do itch, but unlike eczema, they tend to go away after about 24 hours or so. Um, number four and seven are ringworm. Often number seven is very easily mistaken for number five, which is discoid eczema. Um, I have lots of kids that I see in clinic who might have a bit of discoid eczema and they are treated for ringworm. They might have antifungal creams and things like that, but really they have eczema. But the thing to be looked for with ringworm, um, ringworm is contagious and it tends to make a ring shaped patches, which tend to grow slowly outward uh, on any part of the skin, tend to be round, um, with a really raised border. Um, if you treat ringworm, it tends to clear up in the center rather than the border first. Um, scabies, sca um, scabies are contagious. They happen when tiny bugs called mites burrow into the skin. Um, they lay eggs. They like ex eczema, they cause itching and rash. The rash tends to look like pimples. Um, it can also cause like scaly looking patches, but unlike eczema, um, there might be tiny raised like crooked lines where um, usually the lines are like gray white type color and that's where the mites have burrowed into the skin. Something like psoriasis is um, often mistaken for eczema, especially in darker skin sometimes I find where the appearance might be more of a gray type color. It does generally look like eczema, but eczema, but like eczema, but eczema patches tend to be much thinner and can ooze fluid, but psoriasis tends to be much more dry and scaly. Um, number nine, eczema is on baby's head, which, which sometimes we call cradle cap. Sometimes it can go all the way down to their foreheads. We do often treat um, with a antifungal cream because sometimes it can cause like a buildup of yeast. The next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of um, environmental triggers that can irritate eczema skin um, and they can be really different for everyone. The most common ones that I would say generally Things like soaps, detergents and perfumes, we ask every child who um, has eczema to avoid soaps and to use the emollient creams as a soap substitute. Um, sometimes I really struggle with my teenagers who re totally refuse and in any case sometimes it's of almost not worth the fight. So I advise them to use creams that are perfume and, and free. Um, no alcohol, etc., and no sodium lauryl sulfate, because that's proven to thin the skin. Um, dust and dust mites. We advise families to obviously hoover and, and change bed sheets regularly to wash at six to really kill dust, dust mites, to not have things like cuddly toys, cushions and things in bed, because often those things aren't really washed regularly. So if you're not able to wash them regularly, we do sometimes suggest putting them in the freezer because that helps to kill the um, dust mites. Parents are often really concerned about taking their kiddies swimming. So we do sometimes suggest putting on the emollients before going into the water, um, using like a wetsuit, like an all body suit for babies to prevent slipping and then showering after once they've as quickly as you can after they've come out of the water and reapplying their emollients. I think that school age children tend to struggle with that because there's often quite limited time um, 
at school when they're getting dressed. Um, temperature changes, depth, apparently 18 degrees is the most ideal temperature, but generally just to keep the house, the house the homes really cool, try to wear only cotton clothing um, and layer up rather than um, having like a big thick woolly blanket. Um, yeah, but generally the, the, the thing to just to note is that there are lots of triggers, but that help the families to identify the trigger and then come up with a solution to minimize the exposure to that trigger. Next slide, please. So emollients are the um, mainstay of eczema treatment. They um, help to keep the skin flexible and moist. There's like a range of different emollients from ointments, creams, lotions, sprays, gels, Patients can be given several of these to maybe use at different times or on different areas of the body. Applying emollients helps to trap water in the skin and they create a seal on the surface of the skin. They also replace the um, lost fats and natural oils in the skin and they basically repair that brick wall um, to prevent further moisture loss and to prevent um, penetration by like external um, irritants and allergens. So we always advise patients to continue to use the emollients even when the eczema has improved. This will help to prevent flare-ups. The NICE guidelines actually say that children should be using about 250 to 500 grams per week of emollients. Um, so you can't overuse emollients. I think for the prescribers, please ensure that you've prescribed enough. Try to put them on repeat so it's easy for families to get them. Advise patients to use them um, as a soap substitute. And remember that the best emollient is the emollient that the patient will use. Next slide, please. Because obviously eczema is a very individual um, condition. Different emollients suit different people. I've just got a few examples of different emollients. Um, but just in general, it might be that for lots of our families who, for example, if you've got a kid with who's really sweaty or a really clammy baby, although, you know, ointments tend to have higher oil content and generally are better, it might be that that ointment makes the babies really sweaty and then that in turn flares up the eczema. So it might be that you want to use a less greasy or a lighter emollient um, instead of a thicker ointment. So it's about balancing and finding what works for, for the families and what works for the children. Some children use a lighter emollient um, during the day or you know in the warmer summer months. Some children use a thicker one at night or you know if they're going on long journeys. It really depends on um, on on the families and on the child. But generally try to recognize um, that there can be like sensory differences, um, where especially with children with like neurodiversity, things like ASD, or children with like sensory processing issues. Sometimes the feeling or the smell um, might, the children might not like it. Next slide. Um, some children prefer things like sprays because they, you know, if children don't want to be touched, they allow for like non-contact application. Uh, something like Dermal 500, which is a lotion, it's antimicrobial. So for children with um, sort of open areas of eczema or so areas that are at risk of infection or areas are, that are actually infected, we sometimes use um, Dermal 500 as a soap substitute to help with that infection. Um, yeah, so there's a range of different things, but there's a Southeast London emollient guidance that um, basically gives a list of emollients that you can prescribe in Lambeth and Southwark. Um, definitely recognise that the guidance has changed over the years. So sometimes someone's preferred emollient might not be on the guidance anymore because it, it's just due to cost. So it's about finding a suitable alternative and um, encouraging families to purchase things over the counter if that's what they like. Or sometimes we have to get the GPs to compromise 
and and prescribe the things that the creams that are expensive if it means if it's like a child with severe eczema or something next slide please um so topical steroids help to reduce the inflammation that's that the um that's caused by eczema topical steroids and regular emollients are the first line treatment for atopic eczema um so the severity of the eczema is tends to be grouped into four categories if you have a kid with like clear skin then there's no eczema no evidence of active eczema mild there might be you know dry skin and infrequent itching or you know small areas with redness moderate you might have a um like severe dry skin frequent itching redness maybe with or without like escalation or like localized skin thickening for a child with like uh, severe eczema they might have widespread areas of dry skin constant itching redness um there might be extensive skin thickening there might be bleeding oozing cracking there might be some changes to the pigmentation of their skin but generally the treatment that should be offered should be offered based on those categories i wouldn't really expect a child with moderate eczema to then be given a mild cream um to give you an idea of the strength of the different steroids something like um one percent hydrocortisone is mild a moderate um clebetasone is probably about 10 times as strong as hydrocortisone and then the potent steroids are probably about 50 percent 50 times stronger than hydrocortisone I know that probably doesn't help. It does sound like it's strong, but the idea is that if if you need to use, it's only as you need if, you, if a child needs to use it, then they need to use it. Um, I do I agree have with lots that. of, and that's really important. Yeah, well, actually, in terms of the strengths, it's quite helpful to know there was a study done recently that assessed for side effects of the creams, and they showed that even with two trials that had tested. For clobetazone moderate and for hydrocortisone, there were no associated side effects. And even yeah. where you've got the stronger ones, if you use them once a day yeah. for two to four weeks, there was no increase in side effects when compared with general emollients. And exactly as you say, um, Lindsay, when you've got the concerns that are raised by the families, it's exactly what you say there. Are they always going to need it? That's not true. Is it going to thin the skin? No, that's not true. No. And the change in colour, and I want to be really clear, is like I said before, it's down to the eczema trying to heal yes. and recover. And it is not down to the creams. It's such a widely yeah. held concern that I think it's directly addressing and I address it with virtually all pigmented yes. families that I come across what what do you find Lindsay? yeah I definitely definitely agree I think it's it's hard because I think that the concerns are genuine I find that a lot of the mm. patients that I see will say to me oh but you know I was told to use a tiny amount because it's really strong or I should use a pea-sized amount and I think that sometimes we just have to be mindful about how we um, talk about things in that I think that's just has lasting impact on the families and they end up not using it properly in the beginning and because they then end up needing to use it for a longer time they think well I've used it for six months and it isn't working so it must be bad and it just that it just continues the negativity around steroid use so I definitely think that we just need to be mindful about um, how we talk about topical steroids and I always talk to families about the risk versus benefits because like you say Tom there's very minimal documented um, evidence of the risk of topical steroids especially the new age steroids I do think that sometimes back in the day there were different steroids that maybe did cause thinning of the skin and things yeah, that's um, definitely okay. but I do talk to families but I was going to say I do talk to families a lot about the risk versus benefits because you might have a family where the baby's really crying they're not growing they're you know really upset family aren't sleeping that it's impacting the children the other children in the families it might be impacting the baby's growth their development and you know if they're spending all their time 
itching and using all their energy to itch, they might not be meeting their developmental milestones. So that for me versus the risk that's really minimal of topical steroids, I would always say to use the topical steroids if, if that was the concern. So, yeah, next slide, please. So in terms of um, the advice that we give to families, we normally say to use the weakest strength of the steroid that works within the appropriate amount of time. So if you had a baby with um, moderate eczema, we might try a medium strength steroid. We should see some improvement within about um, two weeks. Uh, we, would, we always advise to apply the steroids to only the affected um, areas and to use the fingertip unit as a guide. What I haven't actually got on here is normally we advise to put your emollients on first and then wait at least half an hour and then you put your steroid cream on. Um, we can use steroids safely for up to about four weeks. After that, there isn't, it's not that it's not safe, it's just that there's limited evidence for the um, effect after about four weeks. Um, in terms of stepping down treatment, we usually, um, for children with like really persistent eczema, we usually step down the frequency of the application of the steroids or the potency depending. Um, or we, for children with really recurrent and severe eczema, we tend to wean them down to weekend therapy. And that's when you use the eczema for, use the steroid creams for two consecutive days in a row. And it might be that we, and we, the usual advice would be to clear the skin plus two extra days of the topical steroid. And that's just to clear the, any inflammation that's under the surface of the skin that we can't see. You might then wean down the frequency to two consecutive days a week. Normally, I prefer if the, it doesn't have to be the weekends, but it, I like if it's on the days where the child is exposed to a trigger. So if they go swimming on a Wednesday and, and um, their skin might flare up on that Wednesday, it might be that they do their weekend therapy on those Wednesday, Thursday, their skin then um, heals and settles down and we continue weekend therapy for and review after about 12 weeks. If the patient does have a flare up in between, then you go back to the start of doing every day until it's clear and you follow the process. Um, but I definitely think that the take home message is that topical steroids are safe when used properly. Next slide. Please. Great. That's really helpful. Oh, sorry, carry on. I thought I was going to take over. Go on. <laughs> yeah, so the only thing that I wanted to end on is if the eczema doesn't, isn't um, responding, just make sure you're checking that your steroid that you're using is appropriate. Check that there isn't any steroid hesitancy with the family and that they're actually utilizing that fingertip guide. They're using enough of the emollients, not just putting on a tiny dab, um, treat any underlying infection and identify and reduce exposure to triggers. Um, I think utilize any resources around you, whether that's like online resources, whether that's um, support for families of safeguarding ish concerns, school health visitors, school nurses, early help, et cetera, just to ensure that um, we're putting that child first. And if there's no improvement with the steroid and emollient treatment, then seek a further um, clinical review, whether that's um, referring to dermatology or if suspected allergies, then to the allergy teams and yeah. then I'll hand over to you Tom. Thank you that's great and just on that last point there so I think that for the general uh, the general prescribing practice for the families that you come across in your practice for the audience mm -hmm. I think it's a really sensible step to ask the families to use the cream every day for two weeks to see whether those rashes go because the hesitancy and the concern about is it thinning skin and is it too much and what if I just use it for two days and see and then we stop yeah. is leading to so much inconsistent treatments. If they've been prescribed a cream, at least give that cream a really good go. Are you using it once a day for two weeks and what happened? 
And in many, many cases, they'll have shied away from doing that as a first step. And if they've still got the cream, uh, sorry, still got the eczema after that, then of course it's worth considering further. What families tend to do is that they tend to use it, have worries, and then stop. And then they're worried about the diet, and then they start switching whether it's milks or food or yeah. maternal diets. And you can end up with so many concerns raised, but none of them properly addressed individually, step by step. Mm -hmm. You end up with a storm of concerns that are unfounded. And so I think that it's really helpful to say once a day for two weeks for any creams that you have been prescribed, which are topical sterile creams, and they will be safe. I've not seen side effects, even with hospital practice of steroids, that are down to the yeah. steroids in over 10 years. So it's ever so, ever so safe. And I've never seen a side effect from the moderate creams and from the mild creams that most of the GPs are prescribing first. I have not seen and I would worry that they're not prescribing enough so what they have been prescribing is definitely mm. safe it's probably too safe so you should definitely use this and regularly to get the most benefits out of it. So for the next section we we're going to talk about what to do with the mainstay of other solids and I think what really helpful to do is just wind back to those very first pictures that we have with Lincia's case discussions because what we've been, so Angie, if you're okay to go back, 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 just to those, so Kenny and Joseph. The reason is that we've talked a lot about how uh, eczema can be triggered by different things. We've talked a lot about if it doesn't respond, going up to different strengths, using it for a prolonged period of time and stepping down. But for the next phase of the discussion, it's about concentrating in these young babies. Thank you, Angie, that's really helpful. And I want to be clear when it's safe to introduce egg and peanuts and when it's not a good idea without having some further support from a medical professional. So for each of these slides, you can see clear eczema. And here on the top, you can see that there's an area under the jawbone here, which is clearly red and distinct. It's not got a very clear margin. It's not got lots of scale on it, but it's there. It's also there behind the ear where it's red. And you can see down on the neck and on the upper chest that there's this mottled papula appearance where it's slightly bumpy. So that fits eczema very clearly. So unless that clears up and disappears with some hydrocortisone, then I would think that we need to think about other, um, well, we need to treat the eczema and make sure that gets under control because that'll be causing your problems with you know, sleep and itch and so on. From the point of view of looking for those children without eczema, whereby we can confidently introduce egg and peanuts, we're not looking for children like this. This child has got widespread eczema. You can see on the other photos down the back, there's areas where it's really densely pink and you can't really see normal skin in either of those pictures on the left or the right because there's such pinkness and it's so widespread. And the next slide, please. So the other really nice thing on these pictures here is that you can see around the dryness and the scale on the chest, giving a slightly silvery salmon pinky type of appearance on that top photo. And you can see that it's got a raised edge to it. So there's a classic for dry eczema. Around the, what I want to concentrate on is around the head margins here, you can see where the baby's been rubbing so much that they've had poor hair growth up to the edge of where their hairline should be. So you can see that there's less hair going up into the corner of the forehead there, and that it's tracked with a silvery type line where it's poorly uh, outlined, but you can see there's a fading of the skin pigment there as well. So that'll be intense itchy, and that's eczema. On the legs down there, you can see the patchy, almost coin-like round areas of hypo, so lesser pigmentation, and the papular appearance over the tummy. So for these children, they're going to need at least two weeks of having topical steroids to really properly get them under control. And these pictures are so clear, they probably need um, clobetazone, moderate strength, hydrocortisone, I think won't fix either of these children. These are clear enough that they need clobetazone, they need to see where they get better, and they need to use it for two weeks daily at least to give you an idea of where to pitch treatment. So what I want to say for the next part of the talk is we do need to look for all of those other children that don't have changes in the hairline, don't have this papular appearance and don't have widespread redness or changes to their pigmentation and itch, because those are the children who it's relevant to try to introduce the egg and the peanuts early. If we go back to where we're up to in the presentation. So we're thinking very much about the babies. 
Ideally, if they have a little bit of cradle cap and it went, if they had slightly pink cheeks or and it disappeared after some hydrocortisone, that's fine. And we need to get on with doing some egg. Next one, doing some cow's milk and doing some peanut butter. We know that introducing these regularly as part of the solids diet can protect against the development of milk, egg and peanut allergy in turn. What we want to do here is choose the children when they're first choosing to introduce solids so they don't start on a little bit of potato, a little bit of root veg, a little bit of baby rice, and then go on to a lifetime of eating pouches. That is not what we're after because that won't do them any good. It's too sweet, it's too runny, there's no variety in the texture, and they're not really going to get decent protein and be able to grow very well. But all of these foods are filled with great nutrition, which is super for their calcium and their protein and for making sure we prevent allergies when we can. Next slide, please. So this is from the LEAP study, which was the first study that rewrote the rule book. We used to be cautious about allergens and say, goodness, if anyone's got, um, anyone's got any risk of a, a family history of allergies, just go very gently and don't give them peanuts because you never know what might happen. And this was the trial that showed if you take those children with egg allergy or with consistent eczema, so moderate to severe eczema, we need to test them first, those children, with, like the children that, I, that we've seen from Lindsay's slides earlier, those kind of children who've got moderate to severe eczema, okay? They are more likely to have egg allergy. And so if there's a concern about reacting to egg as well, those children need testing to see whether we can introduce peanuts into their diet. Because if we're able to get babies eating regular peanuts and the consumption group who ate one teaspoon of peanut butter three times a week for four years has much, much less peanut allergy when you compare it to those who were avoiding peanuts for four years. So next slide, well, the next uh, part of the slide. So you can see here that the top line of that left side was the consumption group of eating one teaspoon of peanut butter three times a week. And that relates to the green little box on the right. So you can see at the age of five years, there was a 3% chance of developing peanut allergy if you're able to eat peanut regularly, regularly, regularly in the diet from when they first introduce solids until they go to school. So that's many years. If we avoid peanuts in those children who have got an increased risk of peanut allergy, those with egg allergy or severe eczema, we can see that otherwise their risk of developing peanut allergy is 17%. And that's one of the reasons why peanut allergy is so common in the UK. Next slide, please. So we have an 80% reduction in the risk of peanut allergy by eating peanut regularly. Next slide. And there's the proof of principle that introducing these foods regularly can protect them. Next slide. So what we can see here is that this doesn't just relate to peanuts, it also relates to eating well-cooked egg. And this shows the risk of egg or peanut allergy on the right hand, sorry, on the left hand side, the X, the sorry, the Y axis. OK, so your risk at the top of the left hand side is increasing risk of egg and peanut allergy. But along the X bottom part of the graph is increasing consumption of peanuts and increasing consumption of egg for that line in red. So as you eat more and more and more and more blue peanuts, you are less and less and less likely to get peanut allergy. As you eat more and more and more and more egg, you're less likely to get egg allergy. Next slide. And the significant amounts are that if you're able to eat one teaspoon of peanut butter per week, you are significantly protected against peanut allergy. If you eat more than one teaspoon of peanuts, you are even more protected from peanut allergy. Next slide. And the amount of egg is one egg. If you eat one small egg, per week as a baby, you are less significantly less likely to develop egg allergy. So what we're saying is that if we get on and introduce these foods early in children who don't have long-standing or clear signs of eczema, as we've shown you on the pictures, in all of those normal children without itch, if we introduce egg and introduce peanuts, we're less, we're able to prevent egg and peanut allergy. Next slide. And, you are the perfect people to encourage that. In Australia, they asked all health visitors and uh, GP nurses and community practitioners 
to advise that from the age of introducing solids, it's a good idea to introduce peanut. And you can see the results here. So on the left hand side, we've got the age at which children started to eat peanut. You can see in the blue line, that is what was happening before recommending peanut introduction. You can see this is smattering a small number, up to 20 or 25% of children would gradually have peanuts as they got to their first birthday, which is on the right hand side of that graph. But you can see the health physicists are in the powerful position. If you say to these babies, as they're starting, okay, they've had some carrots and potato, fantastic. Don't bother with the pouches so much. Why not just mix in a bit of peanuts to see how they go and try to give that to them regularly. A teaspoon a week is fantastic. You can see the uptake there. Even with that suggestion, it goes up to 50% of babies having tried and starting to eat peanuts in the first six months, which is fantastic when they're just starting to introduce solids. And that's going to be helpful. You can see it gets higher and higher, and they're over 80% by the time they get to one year. And the result is that they are eating it mostly a few times, but half of them are eating either once a week, twice a week, or three times a week. You can see in that graph on the right, which is great practice. Eating it regularly will protect them from peanut allergy. Next slide. And this is how we recommend for those families that we haven't needed to see or do anything fancy in hospital, for those families where we're happy that they can introduce it step by step along with their first solids because there's no eczema of any note and that they have not no concerns of any allergies or needing testing. We show them these pictures and say that you can have a tiny touch first, a pea-sized amount, then increase to a little baby teaspoon and then one full adult teaspoon of peanut butter. So that's the two baby spoons together as a step-by-step -step incremental approach for introducing peanuts. And these pictures are more or less what we use in hospital for the challenges. You're giving a small amount regularly and increasing it until they're safely having a teaspoon that we would then ask them to continue. And it's a similar process for egg, little taste of egg. Make sure you recommend that the families cook the egg properly. So if they're scrambling and cook it all the way through, so it's not runny, it looks like you know, bubbles of egg with water. We're not after runny, fluffy type mixture of soupy um, scrambled egg. We want well-cooked egg and they have not dissimilar amounts of so pea-sized amounts, half a teaspoon and then a teaspoon and then working up to a full egg that they have. Um, babies as they start to wean, of course, may only manage a quarter of an egg regularly. And if they do that three or four times a week, that is great. And then build it into two portions of half an egg or even one or two eggs per week by the time they get near to their first birthday. And that is going to have a huge impact on two things, preventing them from having egg allergy, but also proving that they can have egg and they don't need to worry about avoiding foods if they otherwise have a little bit of eczema that develops later, but they've already started having peanut and egg. Well, they're obviously not allergic to peanut and egg, they're already eating it. Next slide. So this is a survey which I may have shown you before. If you just take a phone snapshot of that QR code on the left, I'd be really grateful if you could show it to some families. We're trying to measure all of those parents over six months to 12 months of age. We're trying to measure whether they've introduced milk, egg and peanuts in their baby's diet. And it would be great if you could show that to families that you see of toddlers and of babies to see how they approached egg, milk and peanuts in their baby's diet. So please do uh, take a photo and share that with families. Next slide, please. Because if we don't, and if we don't treat the eczema properly, if we don't provide clear advice of saying it's safe to use once a day for two weeks, if we don't get them eating the allergens and they're doing it regularly and they know they're safe, we end up with terrible avoidance patterns and it's difficult for the, for the babies, it's difficult for the mums. In our clinic at St Thomas's, with the children that come where they're worried about their babies having allergies and the mum is breastfeeding, we have almost half of them, the mums are avoiding foods in their diet. And you can see how widespread this is here. So over 60% of the mums who are breastfeeding are avoiding milk, over a quarter of them avoiding egg, and then some of them are avoiding multiple foods, and then it starts to get to wheat and nuts and so on. And it's very difficult because when your mum that you're working with has started to avoid not only milk but also other foods as well particularly whilst they're breastfeeding and in many cases when the child hasn't even tasted milk formula it's ever so difficult because avoiding milk isn't going to clear up the problem it's not driven by milk you need to put the creams on 
And so if they find there's no resolution with avoiding milk, then mum might start to avoid other foods in her diet. And actually, we still need to treat the eczema. That's going to be how we get the child settled. Next slide, please. So we need to bear in mind that overall, the prevalence of milk allergy, if we add the milk uh, numbers 0.7 and 1.7 together, we're talking something like 2% of all babies. So something like 100 babies of Lambert and Southwark will have proven milk allergy. That's what we would expect. OK, 100 out of 7,000 births a year. Egg allergy is equally as common. If they're reacted to tastes of egg and so on, then it's something that we can look into more detail to get peanuts into their diet as well. But this is less common to have peanut allergy, wheat allergy, and the other foods. Okay, so let's try and get these other foods into their diet after they've had their little bits of eczema treated and get them constructively reviewed and get them eaten to protect them. Next slide. So we'll talk now about are there babies and how do we recognize those who are allergic to milk and then we'll have a little chat again about mothers changing their diets and hopefully we'll have some time for questions before the end i know we need to finish it quarter past thank you danielle so um are there babies with eczema who are allergic to cow's milk so um if you can just click next please as we can see in this table, um, eczema can be present uh, as one of the symptoms in children with cow's milk allergy. But it's really important to highlight that cow's milk is not the primary cause of eczema. Um, but um, children with eczema, they are more likely to develop food allergies and cow's milk it, uh, can trigger or worsen um, eczema. Uh, but it's very important uh, because parents can become very anxious uh, about the conflict information that they find and um, they start to think that uh, the cause of eczema is cow's milk. So it's very important as health professionals to ensure that parents, uh, they are advising the first line treatment before considered cow's milk allergy. Uh, next, please. And this become more evident when we see the prevalence of eczema compared to cow's milk allergy. As we see uh, around 15% uh, of infants in England can develop eczema and while only about one to 2% of infants you develop cow's milk allergy as we saw previously. So uh, this lead us to conclude that uh, cow's milk uh, allergy is not only associated with eczema, it's rarely associated with eczema. Next. Next slide, yeah. So of course, if um, that child went uh, through a first line treatment with um, emollients and steroid creams, as we saw before, did not respond to this first line treatment for at least, uh, and tried this treatment for at least two weeks, uh, then uh, allergy fox clinical history can be taken and to assess um, the possibility of um, cow's milk allergy. And some of the, of the things that we can consider is um, if the child has multiple symptoms, for example, if the child is also present with reflux and discomfort of, after feeds, then uh, increase the likelihood of cow's milk allergy. Also says um, the feeding history, for example, if it's a child who was exclu ex exclusively breastfeeding and responding to the treatment, um, first learned treatment for eczema, then, for example, uh, a formula uh, was introduced and then this triggered uh, flare ups of eczema, then uh, increase, of course, the possibility of cow's milk allergy and assess the family history of atopic disease and also if there are any concerns up regarding weight and growth, um, because this also can, could be an indication of uh, the, the association of cow's milk allergy. Next, please. And if uh, cow's milk allergy is suspect or even confirmed in case of Ig uh, cow's milk allergy, uh, it's very important to keep supporting breastfeeding and avoid unnecessary maternal diet restrictions. So as I said, if uh, um, symptoms or eczema was only um, triggered uh, with the introduction of a formula, 
So it's not uh, recommended to advise moms to uh, do any uh, dairy um, diet restrictions. And uh, it's very important to support this um, the mom's diet. So if uh, dairy-free diet is required, important to uh, advise moms to start a supplement um, with calcium and vitamin D, ensure that this mom is a, uh, also can have at least two sources of uh, alternative products fortified with calcium so she can achieve her requirements. Next, please. And if it's a formula fed baby, uh, it's important to ensure that, uh, uh, that of course, the, the, the treatment of cow's milk is elimination of cow's milk. So we start with exclusively the hydrolyzed formulas uh, where the protein is broken down um, and only advise on amino acid formula if there are any other concerns, uh, for example, as risk of anaphylaxis or faltering growth or if this child also did not respond or eczema was not improved, or other symptoms were not improved after um, the use of extensively hydrolyzed pharma for at least four weeks. Children with um, Ig cow's milk allergy, um, if uh, they can use soya formula after six months of age, so are those children who, has, uh, who have um, symptoms within two hours, and of course, if this child is um, over one year of age, they can um, use plant-based alternative milks uh, as part of elimination diet, uh, ensure that the, those um, options are fortified with calcium uh, and that this child uh, can receive a regular support to ensure that their, um, their diet is, uh, is, uh, is enough to achieve their requirements. And if a child is formula fed and if they have less than 500 mLs of formula, ensure also that the um, parents are advised to supplement vitamins A, C, and D. And that's it, I think. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we want to make it really clear if they develop uh, eczema and they are breastfed, the first step is to treat the eczema. If they have unresponsive eczema, even when they have gone up to having moderate strength, they need to use it properly, right? Once a day for two weeks. And it's only really for those families whereby they've got great skin and then they've introduced the formula directly. And then there's been an obvious change in symptoms, which is linked to it. And then they can go off the formula and they have resolution. And then if they introduce it again, then there is a reproducible reaction with a cow's milk formula, then we consider that there are associated signs with the cow's milk ingestion, okay? Because if we're relying on mums changing their diet and the impact on the diet for the child through breastfeeding, it's extraordinarily difficult and I will show you why. So next slide. This is the kind of scenario that we're having, but let when we were discussing the cases with Lindsay at the start. So a three-month-old breastfed baby who has not had any formula and they start rubbing their face. Often families are worried about, well, what's causing this? It's nothing that um, I can see as a trigger, so it must be something to do with the diet because all of the, all of the nutrition is coming from mum, right? And so, next slide. So they start asking questions and they say, is, is my baby allergic? Because eczema is making them so itchy. Next slide. And then they say, well, you know, if it has to be milk I've taken out already, and if it's not getting better, then surely I need to take out other foods and they need to treat the eczema first. We know that because even when you measure the amount of cow's milk protein in a whole breast feed, there is less than one mil of milk, less than one mil of fresh cow's milk in the breast feed when mums have drunk a whole litre of fresh cow's milk, less than a mil. So we're talking such an infinitesimally tiny amount, it's 0 0.001 milligrams, milligrams of cow's milk protein. That is 0 0.0001 grams of cow's milk protein in a whole breastfeed if mum has had a whole litre of fresh cow's milk. So it's so tiny, and we know that eczema affects a quarter of all babies. So it's so implausible that that degree of milk allergy being so, 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 so sensitive 
is going to be triggering widespread eczema across so many of our babies. So the concerns of mums are grossly overinflated because they feel so responsible, because they find it difficult to access treatments for the eczema, and because they go to A&E or go to other, and why not try avoiding milk? It's easy to say, it has no cost implications for the professional practitioner, and yet actually, it gives that child a legacy of likely food allergy, which is so difficult when it comes to weaning. There's been two systematic reviews which have shown that if you blanket avoid allergens from mum's diet, it doesn't impact eczema. And this has been said so many times, and yes, it's widely practiced in the diet. So we've got clear evidence that it's so deeply unlikely and trials and systematic reviews to say it doesn't help eczema. We need to treat the eczema with what does work. Next slide. So the only reasons why we consider that it's remotely plausible that maternal ingestion of milk can have an impact on the baby is if there are ongoing reproducible signs of linked symptoms each and every time that the mum has dairy in their diet. And it's not down to just mild eczema, which isn't properly treated. It's down to eczema that persists, even though they've had moderate strength topical corticosteroids. So that's umivate or plobetazone. And if it's persisting, and if, there's, if we're worried about blood in the stool, not just one fleck or streak of blood in the stool, but if after mum has had a decent milk exposure, so we're talking you know, a big pudding with lots of chocolates or plenty of cream or fresh milk or milkshakes, that then the child has not just a little speck of blood, but we're talking milk and blood in the stool for three days. Then if there are other symptoms associated as well, where the baby's really deeply unhappy and there's reflux and they're out of sorts, it is possible that the milk in mum's diet is making a difference to the breast milk and that that is cow's milk allergy. But it is so unlikely amongst the mainstay of those who avoid milk just in case and it isn't a helpful way of going forwards and you're completely um, supported from a medical point of view to say rather than just avoiding more and more foods why not reintroduce the milk back into your diet mum so that's the only change you make into your diet and there's never been a baby who's had an unsafe reaction to cow's milk that has been via breastfeeding so the right thing is to treat the eczema and then reintroduce milk. And if there's no sudden surge in the eczema, it wasn't down to the milk anyway. It's just eczema we need to treat properly from the baby's point of view. Next slide, please. So we can now go to a case discussion of uh, either we can catch up on the cases before or we can ask for some cases that um, some questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. So just next to where the number of participants are listed. On the right there's a Q&A box. Please type in any questions there and that would be really helpful to hear from you. Angie, you're, uh, you're on mute at the moment. Do you want to go back and Lindsay talk about what, actually I think we should probably leave it there and wait for some questions to see, probably, because I think by going through the previous cases from before and what happened later relates more to hospital care and I think if we recognise those children who are fine to go ahead and introduce egg milk and peanuts, um, that is helpful as well. Are there any questions for anyone who wishes to ask? Sorry, I got a bit lost there. Yeah, we've got a few questions in the chat. Thank you, everybody. Oh, That's okay. fantastic. Yeah, so should we run through those and then you let me know if you want to go through the case studies if we have time? Sure. So this question from um, for Lincea, um, is the amount of emollient needed for a baby up to 12 months the same as any as an older child? Uh, yes, I'd say that maybe a, ba a baby needs, a ba of the big tubs, maybe like half a tub a week. I tend to advise parents to um, reapply the emollients with every nappy change. They're, they tend to be, um, you know, changing the nappy like six times or so a day. So that's what that's the advice that we tend to give. I, and I also say to them to put the emollient on as thick so they can write their baby's name into the cream. That's how thick the layer of cream should be. Thank you. It's a shame that we can't get people talking back, but it's the format of this webinar. But thank you, Lindsay. We've got one as well. I think it's directed towards health visitors, but I'm sure um, 
you guys on the panel will be able to answer. So it, uh, the question asks, can you please describe if and how you support families to introduce foods like peanut and egg to their babies as they start solids? Is it a deliberate conversation? Do families ask about it? So I think it is for health visitors, is, it, is this something which health visitors would yeah directly and explicitly focus on when supporting families are starting solids do you know that from your professional experience yeah i think it's really important that we start doing more of that i mean health physicists at the moment have a really rough rise you know we've mm -hmm. gone from having to do so many things remote we've got all these concerns about vulnerable children you know we're only just going back to some of these weigh-in centers having face-to-face -face contact so it's really difficult to assess skin um, to assess how they're getting on to be able to see these babies regularly. I think it is important to mention, and I, I would mention this as a routine thing with normal families as you come across. So, and I would do it from three, four, five months of age, you know, in terms of catching up how they're doing in their, in their health um, and uh, how, how you, know, you carry on with different foods, what foods you're going to start with, when are you going to start doing egg, when are you going to start doing peanuts? I would just put it in there. Because unless we normalise it and we have little bits and introduce, and then with the aim that they have a teaspoon a week, then it's very difficult to make a, make use of that protection if we if we don't tell families. So I think it, I really feel for uh, for health visitors that are running with lots of other priorities at the moment. Um, what's your because Lindsay, you'll be sitting in at the community patch meetings with how things are actually running on the ground at the moment. What's your view on that? I think we might have lost Lindsay. She's disappeared. Danielle, do you see some of the patch meetings? Yeah. Yeah, for example, I see babies like around three months of age, and this is a common question from par from parents. So um, the of course I see um, patients with suspect cow's milk allergy. Uh, and so parents are really concerned about introducing other allergens. Uh, but I think it's a very good opportunity for health visitors to reinforce to not delay uh, the introduction of any allergens and reinforce the early introduction of egg and peanut uh, as we don't see all the children. Uh, so and they can have this opportunity to to reinforce this message. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's helpful if it comes across as a whole team approach. We've even had um, a postnatal uh, midwife who is working on the postnatal boards who was saying that even on the postnatal boards, there are questions about allergies. And please being as reassuring as possible, breastfeeding is best under all circumstances. It is specifically designed to do the job and there is no chance that they're being poisoned by it. It's just so destructive to have the idea that maternal diet has such a big impact. So please reassure on all cases. Um, I think it gets, it's, 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 yeah, it's so destructive, but I think where they've, um, where they can be supported to use that as the mainstay and carry on and really be confident doing it, um, that would be the best approach. That's great, thank you. Um, we, well, we're, we're bang on time. I don't know if you quickly wanted to go back to the case studies or do you want to wrap there up are there? In the Q&A, there are a couple of questions that came up. One was um, just how common is eczema? Oh, someone missed the start of the, um, the session. So a quarter of all babies have eczema. And, you know, less than 2% have got milk allergy, a milk allergy that is so sensitive to be detected in, 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 in breast milk. I mean, it's going to be 0.00001. So, I mean, it really is very safe to treat the eczema as the main issue if you're seeing that as the main issue. And that's the main message. Um, there aren't any other questions which have come up on the Q&A panel. So, yeah. And uh, Lindsay has disappeared, though, hasn't she? So we're not going to be able to uh, get an update. <laughs> on the I'm rest back. of those cases but say oh no you're back Lindsay tell us a little bit about what happens I'm to those back. cases I'm back. <laughs> we've just I'm finished back. the end um, of the question no worries. We've just gone through all of the questions in the Q and A, and I think um, if you wanted to speak to the case studies that you had um, pre previously, then we might be able to steal a few more minutes of people's time. Um, okay, brilliant. Brill. So, Kenny, um, the little six-month-old baby, I actually um, started him on a moderate um, topical steroid for his face, which 
we sometimes do, but because your the skin on your face is a bit thinner, I tend to be more cautious with that. And he needed a, a potent steroid for his body. So when babies need um, high the higher strength steroids, that does um, get my spider sense since tingling, and it does make me think that maybe there is something else going on that's just not typical or standard um, eczema. Um, so Kenny had allergies to cow's milk, eggs, coconut, oat, sesame and nuts and he was seen in the allergy clinic um, at Evelina. I can't... My internet is really rubbish. There's everything that you said so far. We can we can hear you if we can't see you. Oh, she's disappeared. Oh, okay. So, just to finish up, and um, I will carry on the story from there because I, I was involved in Kenny's care in the next child as well. Um, so for those children who have tried hydrocortisone or they've been pitched in straight at Umavate or Clobastosone, the moderate strength, if they use it daily for two weeks and they still have eczema, please refer them. So you're all in the catchment where you'll be able to refer to St. Thomas's. So um, I think we can send out the email um, with this presentation so that we're getting hold of the children who do not respond to moderate topical corticosteroids after using it daily for two weeks. If we're in this group where this is still a persistent problem, then we do need to look into the diet and do testing, both to work out what they're safe to wean onto, but also to look for foods that we can protect them, get into their diet and protect them from food allergies. There was a mention in the Q&A as well of a child who came to us who had such terrible eczema that mum was avoiding lots of different foods in her diet because she was so desperate to make progress with the eczema. And so where you've used daily two weeks of clobestone moderate, then please get them referred. What we do from then is we do testing. You can test for allergies at any age. Um, you can do it by blood testing. You can do it by skin testing, only when the skin has cleared. And then we look to see whether or not there are other common food allergies that are driving part of this problem. Um, and we will, of course, look into milk and egg and we tailor it according to their current diet at the time. But it's important to make sure that we also find the foods that they can have as substitutes so that they can grow and go through uh, healthily with their early stages of growth um, for their nutrition. There's another common pattern, which I think is worth saying, is that when the eczema is so severe as this, it can make them so itchy that they only want to breastfeed. They haven't got the concentration, the time, the interest to build up the skills to start thinking about solids. They can refuse to go through those developmental patches because they just can't cope with it. Um, and with those families where it's making an impact, so they're waking regularly and through the night, the family will be normally tearful and in bits. And if you're able to support in those families where it's down to eczema, please, you know, if it's, if it's that bad, please just refer them straight to us with the email address and we will accept referrals from your email. You're angry, you're on Olivia. Go for it. I've all finished. <laughs> OK, well, I think just thank you so much for everybody on the panel. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for all of the questions. Um, and we'll be sure to send the slides, any resources, and we'll have a recording. Um, yeah, through to you with your CPD certificates in the next couple of days. So, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and um, we'll let you know if we have any more webinars in the future. OK. Thank you.